That's right. Wrong. That's wrong. No, just kidding. Just hold on. That's a lot more on my screen. Okay. So, um, if you've ever talked to me about development, you probably know I'm a proponent of functional programming. I think there's a lot of um, benefits that we can gain by uh, making more functional code. And, um, yeah, I plan to tell you about them. So, what are we doing here? So, I'm going to give you a brief history of functional programming. We're going to talk about what functional programming is. And then we're going to look at some code. Um, the code's going to be some JavaScript, some poorly written JavaScript, and we're going to turn it into nice, clean Haskell. All right. <laughs> All right, so the history part. Uh, it started with Lambda Calculus that came around about the 30s. Um, from there, we, uh, well, not we, but someone developed Lisp in the 50s based entirely off of Lambda Calculus. Um, so for a long time there, FP was pretty popular in academia. Um, you'd need a lot of resources due to like some mem memory consumption and a few other things that uh, functional programming needs that the resources weren't really there at the time. So it start, started falling off around the 90s a bit. Um, and then in the 2000s, FP started picking up again. Our hardware was much better now. Um, we had better ways of optimizing uh, our functional programs. And um, yeah, so now new functional programming languages pop up pretty frequently. Um, for some reason, everyone wants to re-implement Lisp constantly, so there's that. All right, um, so where to start? I think the best place is understanding how functional programming is different from what we probably already know and what's familiar to us uh, when we're coding. And that's going to be imperative programming. So imperative programming uh, really relies on statements. So like conditional statements, assignments, loops. And it's kind of driven by side effects. So in most um, imperative languages, you're going to be, like all of your values will be mutable. So you can change them, edit them. And um, there are void functions, which don't return any meaningful results. So the implication there is that it's doing some sort of change to the state of the program. All right, um, so then what is functional programming? So it's more declarative. So everything in functional programming is an expression. And an expression is just going to be a bit of code that results in some sort of value that we care about. Um, and also, there's a lot of use of higher order functions, which we'll talk about shortly. And Contrary to imperative programming, we want to minimize, contain, or just do away with entirely any side effects in our code. So in a functional language, you're probably going to have everything being immutable by default. Uh, you're going to want to use pure functions if it's not enforced by the language itself. Um, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And because of uh, some of the other things I just talked about, your, your language is going to rely on what are called closures. So we'll go over those. All right, start, uh, we have pure functions. So they have no side effects. It just takes input and spits something out. And the result from that function needs to be dependent on whatever you input into it. So if I go and call a function a bunch of times with the same input, Every single time, I should see the same output coming out of it. Um, so some benefits there. Uh, it allows for memoization. That's not a misspelling. It's uh, <laughs> basically caching. So once you calculate a result, you shouldn't need to calculate it again. And so you can uh, do some optimizations there. And um, some big words, referential transparency. This is kind of res a result of some of the other things I talked about. But there's some benefits there as well that we'll talk about. All right, so really all this means is that when I have an expression somewhere in my code, uh, well, let's say I have multiple instances of the same expression in my code, if I can go and replace all of those expressions with their result everywhere in the code, and the code runs in the exact same manner, um, then that expression is referentially transparent. Um, and so why do we care about that? Well, like I said, we can memoize our results, but also, it helps a great deal with debugging programs, and also, as a result of that, it helps with testing. 
So um, in some functional programs, you can almost get the tests to write themselves, which is kind of cool. All right, and then there's also, like, if you wanted to, you could prove that your program is correct, and the compiler can apply all sorts of optimizations that it wouldn't be able to otherwise. All right, and higher order functions. So all that is is a function that either, either or takes um, a f another function as a parameter or returns a function as a result of the call to the function. Um, to support that, the language must support functions being first class citizens, which just means there are other values like everything else. So you can store them in variables, pass them to functions, return them from functions, everything. All right, and because of higher order functions and the possibility that they might access data outside of their scope, we need to be able to enclose that scope along with the function somewhere where it can persist. So like um, packaging it in an object on the heap or something like that, um, rather than keeping local variables on the stack because those will disappear. So um, we need closures. It's not just a thing in JavaScript. Any language that has higher order functions need to have closures. So that's the spiel. Now let's look at some code. Got a slide here for telling me that's time. All right. So what are we looking at here? We've got pretty poorly written JavaScript. Um, we wouldn't actually write JavaScript like this, but it's written like this to prove a point. So it's very um, imperative, right? So we have loops, and loops, by definition, are going to change values. And uh, we have a list that we're actually modifying in place, which we'll see in a second. Um, so what this program is going to do is take a list of links, and first uh, go through and filter out invalid links. Then uh, next, we have another function. Um, I don't know about you, but I've posted links on Slack that have tracking data and people get angry. So what we're going to do is just cut off the query string to avoid that. All right. So let's uh, run that real quick and see what comes out. All right. So we have an array. It's a sparse array. So we have all we've been doing is setting the bad values to empty strings. And we see that there's no um, query strings on any of them. Cool. So it works, at least. Um, but what if we went and added some crap to that list? So I'm going to push some crap on here. Jeremy, we're all trying to heal. <laughs> it's been time. <laughs> All right, so now, as you can probably tell, we're going to end up with a list that now has invalid URLs. Um, so this is obviously a contrived example, but this problems like this actually creep up in our code quite frequently. Um, it might not be as explicit, but uh, all these like arrays, objects, they're references to the actual object in memory. And so when you go modifying it in certain ways, you don't know how it's being used elsewhere necessarily. And you can end up causing issues like that, right? So um, with these mutable data structures, it becomes hard to manage that. Hard to debug, because now I have to, if I want to write tests, I, will, I might need to test these function separately, but also in conjunction, depending on how they're mutating the array. Um, so there's a lot of issues there. All right, so now we're going to take a look at Haskell. And what we're going to do is piece by piece rewrite this program in Haskell. Um, Haskell's not going to let us do anything that isn't functional um, for the most part. And so we'll kind of see how that looks. Um, just a brief overview on how Haskell works. Uh, so like I said, it's purely functional. So probably the most functional language there is. Um, if you didn't have any side effects whatsoever, it'd be hard to output anything to the user. So there's always some leeway there. But um, it is a mostly functional language. 
it is statically typed. So unlike JavaScript that's dynamically typed, um, everything in Haskell has a specific type, every value. Um, so yeah, we'll learn a bit more as we go through. So let's take a quick peek over here again. Um, let's start with something small. So we have this regex pattern um, that we're going to take and we want to run it against each of the links in our list. And this regex pattern, I uh, assume Stack Overflow is a reputable source, right? Um, should work. And uh, testing whether or not these are valid URLs. Um, so we'll, let's just do that part. So mainly this part right here, setting up so that we can get a true or false value based on how the uh, links match up with the regex pattern. All right, so we'll write a function here, is valid URL, going to specify what type it's going to be, so it's going to take a string and return a Boolean. So the type here is actually a function that takes a string and returns a Boolean. Now let's write the function itself. So it's going to take a URL, and we're going to use this regex library I have pulled in here to run that URL against a match. This is the match operator that that library is providing us. And we're going to take this regex pattern there and drop that in there. So it's modified a bit just because of how Haskell handles regex patterns versus how um, JavaScript does, but it's the same regex pattern at the end of the day. All right. So we have a function. It should be able to test a single link. So let's try it out. What I'm going to do is start up the GHC is the compiler for Haskell, and it has an interactive console that we can use. So I'm going to tell the interactive console here to read in our program and see what happens. Feel free to point out any issues that you see. Print my filter, you never Oh, yeah. So, ignore that for now. Let's reload it. All right, so now let's take this first link here. Should be valid. And we will run this is valid URL function against it. Okay, we got true. Good. Um, just for argument's sake, let's make sure that it can find invalid URLs. And we get false. Cool. So um, that's one piece of the puzzle there. Let's go back over to our JavaScript program and see what else we can pull in. So let's take a similar approach with our remove query strings function and start with just being able to remove it from a single um, instance in the list. All right, so again, regex pattern, we're doing a string replace there. So, I'll write that, and let's just call it drop query string. Now you see here, I'm not actually declaring the type. Um, that's because Haskell actually implements uh, what's called type inference. So I don't have to declare the type in most cases it usually can figure out, the compiler that is, usually can figure out what type I'm using and type check against that. So, kind of neat. All right, so it should be able to tell that that's a function. All right, uh, so there's sub regex. This is basically the string replace method in the regex library. And the context of this function I actually need a regex object, so I'm just going to use this, um, what do you call it? It's going to turn this string into a regex object. All right, so we're calling the sub regex function on a regular expression. We want to give it the string that we want it to check against, and if it finds the pattern, what we want to replace it with. So we want to remove it, so we're just going to drop in the empty string there. All right. And feel free to stop me if you have any questions, please. All right, so let's reload that. 
right, we're good. So now let's take this link again, which has a query string, and run our drop query string method on it. Just trying to copy and paste here. Let's see. One more time. <coughs> type it in. There we go. All right. So we run it, spits out a link with no query string. Cool. Got that part. All right. So now we'll have to do a bit more heavy lifting. So we can't, um, due to the nature of Haskell, uh, we can't write loops like this loop here. So, like I said before, we're changing the value of i with each iteration, um, and uh, the for loop itself is running a test that's a statement, and number of issues there. So, what other options do we have? Well, we have recursion, which I'm sure most of you know, if not all of you, uh, but uh, recurs a recursive function is just a function that recalls itself. So with recursive functions, you want to make sure that you have a base case to stop the recursion from continuing on to oblivion. Um, and then you want you know, your actual recursive body after that case. So let's start there. All right, so filter invalid URLs. We're going to write a function here. It's going to take a list of URLs. Oh, I'll save that part. So our base case here, what we want to do is iterate over this list and go to every value in there, um, and then decide whether or not we want to keep it. Um, to do that, our base case is going to be when we hit the end of that list. And so in Haskell and most other functional programming languages, every list at the end has some sort of empty list or nil or some object there that's like, okay, this is the end. So that's the case we're going to um, be looking for. So in the case that it is an empty list, we want to not recur, but return an empty list um, to terminate our new list. So this might look kind of funky. This is, and we'll go deeper into it, um, but this is another feature of Haskell and most functional programming languages called pattern matching. And so it's kind of a mix of uh, case statement, but also with a touch of, or not restructuring, destructuring that you might have seen in JavaScript. So it can match on the patterns of the input, and it at the same time can sort of pick apart those objects coming into the function, which we'll see in a minute. So right now, this is just going to be the case that we have an empty string um, that we're calling the function with an empty list, not an empty string. All right, so now let's see how we write the case that we have a list that isn't empty. So like I said, you can start to break apart these inputs uh, using pattern matching. So we're going to look for a pattern where a list has an element in it. All right. Okay. So what we're doing here, this colon is called the cons operator. It's basically if you think of it as a linked list, it turns the first value into a part of the list and points it to the rest of the list. So this is just basically pushing, um, well, this is doing the opposite, but it's pushing that URL onto the list of URLs. And in this case, since we're doing this in a pattern matching statement, we're actually pulling off that first element on the list. So now, we're going to use an if expression. So unlike if statements in JavaScript or other uh, imperative languages, an if expression it needs to return some sort of value at the end of the day. So really, it's just a ternary expression. So I, I know I've gone on tangents about ternary expressions and how you shouldn't use them as control. And in this case, you can't. So that's awesome. I'm happy. All right, so what we want to do is if 
the case that our URL is valid. Then we return, so we have a valid URL, we want to keep it, but we also want to make sure we get the rest of the list filtered through this uh, filter and valid URLs function. So we're going to use that cons operator to put together a list, and at the end we're going to attach our filter and valid URLs called with the rest of our list. So you can see here we have picked apart this list and pulled them out into separate uh, variables or references that we're using. So we're calling it with what's left in the list after we're done. And then in the case that the URL is invalid, we want to leave it out, but we still want to filter out the rest of the list. So we'll return that. Does this make sense? Because this can be kind of hard to wrap your head around it. We're basically going to the end of the list and then building it back up only with the values we want from back to front. All right, so if I don't have any mistypes in there, let's reload that. Looks good. For now, I'm just going to copy this links list here, paste it into our console. So now we have links there, and then we're going to call uh, is valid filter invalid URLs on that list. All right, so it's kind of hard to read, but it looks like it did filter out stuff like this string and the URLs with the curl in front, so looks good. Cool. So we're halfway there. All right, so now we have to do something similar with the remove query string method. Um, we need to again iterate over the list, but rather than trying to pick out elements that we want to drop, we just want to change elements that are already there and um, create a new list out of that. So, slightly different operation, but it's going to look pretty darn similar to this guy here. So we'll copy this, paste that down here, go through and use my fancy IntelliJ shortcuts. New query string. All right, so it's, again, going to be recursive because we need to iterate over the list. Um, we're still going to want to pull out that first element of the list and move on with the rest of them. But rather than this if statement, all we really need is this piece. Oops. With one change. So we want to make sure that... Um, on each element of the list, we're calling this drop query string function to remove the query string if it's there. So here we're doing the same thing, building up this list, but calling uh, our drop query string method on each element. So let's see if that works. And copy this guy in again. And we'll do move query strings on links. All right, so it worked. We don't have any query strings on there, but we still have all of the other garbage that we haven't filtered out because we haven't called our other function on it. So let's do that now. First, filter out, then remove query string. All right. So uh, this is what's known as uh, function composition. So we're taking the output of this first call and piping it in as the input to this one. So there's that. Let's uh, reload. And let's just call our main now. All right, so now we've gotten full parity with the JavaScript program uh, with much less code, but we can still even clean it up from there. Um, so we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, one thing to note, if I go and print out, no, that would not be in scope, would it? All right, let's just add this line here, print out links. 
reload, well main, and the second one hasn't been touched at all. It's still intact um, from when we declared it up here. All right, cool. So each one of these functions is creating a whole new list. Um, so we can still run all of these same operations on there without modifying the overall state of the running program and having to try and track that down. We can uh, confidently test these functions individually because we know that, sure, if we call them that, uh, as a composition, they might have a different effect, but it has no side effects there. So we know if we test this function here, it's always going to do what it's supposed to do if we have that all tested. Cool. So um, it was cool to go through these recursive calls, but what if we wanted to filter out on something other than the invalid URLs? What if I wanted to filter out based on this pattern? So filter out ones that have query strings. So how we've written this here, can't really reuse much of it, but what we're actually doing is we're just creating a filter. So we can um, just use that function and we'll call it invalid URL. So filter is probably something you're familiar with in JavaScript and plenty of other languages. And it's doing just what we're doing. It expects first a function that's what's known as a predicate. So predicate just takes a value, maps it to some Boolean value. Um, and then filter is going to use that with each uh, object in the list that you provided after that. And it's going to check against that function. If it returns true, it's going to keep it. If it returns false, it's going to drop it. All right, so let me comment this out. So let's rewrite our filter invalid URLs real quick using filter. So like I said, it takes a function, which we already have here. So we can just pass that in as an argument to the filter function. And then uh, we'll give this thing an argument here, and we'll pass that in as well. All right, let's just make sure that we still are up and running. Oh. Oh. There we go, run main. And up here, we are still getting our filtering. Cool. So that's even cleaner. A um, lot less code than what we have over in the other program. And we can do the same here with remove query string. It's just going to be using map instead of filter. Because like I said before, it's not filtering anything. It's just modifying each value in the list. So we'll just do that real quick. Oops. Draw query string, and we'll give it our list of URLs. Reload, we run, and How again. Do you with map here, scale? Is it the same concept as a as a Java map, or is it a little bit? It's shockier? a function. Or do, does Java? I know Java Streams has a map function, but it's not like a map like a hash map. So I'm not sure which one is the map based upon stuff that you're passing into it. No, so it's actually doing a mapping. You can think of it more like that. It's a function. You give it another function, that is your mapping function. So in our case, we're doing drop query string. It's taking a string, presumably a URL, and um, dropping the query string off of it. And so it maps the URL to the query stringless URL. So that's our mapping, and then we pass it the list, and that's what we're going to go over and run. So if we look back in the original implementation we had, we're doing just that. With each element we come to in the list, we're just running drop query string, and then tacking it onto the rest of the list. Make sense? Yeah, it's just when I see map, I think. Yeah, it just can. The, just the data, or the, the, the actual data structure. and It know, can definitely get a bit confusing, especially when there's not like this, you don't have your parameters wrapped in um, parentheses, so it can be kind of hard to discern what's going on. Well, uh, 
So based on your declaration, right, you, your, it is valid URL function actually. What type um, invalid URL is? Mm -hmm. um, could it be, like, that's not necessary in that case, is it? No. Is there, I just like, did it for, uh, just to show that it's actually, the value is a type that's a function. Right. When is it necessary? Because it looks like from the way this, everything's declared that like type concurrent is kind of always an idea. Um, certain recursive calls. Well, so with Haskell, I don't think there's many cases. It comes up a lot in Scala. Any recursive call in Scala, you have to type explicitly because to figure out the type, it goes and tries to run through the recursive function right. and ends up yes. recurring to infinity. I think there's cases like that in Haskell, but um, off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Do you know if that helps like optimization or anything? No, because this happens at compile time. Okay. So you're going to, if you're running it you're in production, you're going to be running a binary that's already compiled. So I'm having trouble separating Haskell versus JavaScript from functional versus imperative. Is it possible to make the original JavaScript functional? Do you have to oh, absolutely. So, I mean, it would be helpful to me if you could. Yeah, I yeah, can, you know, so real quickly. Not the whole thing, but. Yeah, so. <laughs> all right, um, let's see here. What do we do now? All right, so um, in ES6, in ES5 maybe, you have maps and filter functions as part of objects and arrays. So here, we're actually calling it on the object, which is quite a bit different from the Haskell. Um, because usually you have functions and you can pose those and call them on the objects, um, or call them with objects as parameters. But here we'll call the filter function on links. I usually use lodash for this, so if I'm writing something wrong, please tell me. Um, so we'll give it a function, which is going to be our uh, predicate. We'll take the value and what are we doing? Oh, running the, this regex pattern. All right. So ugly, ugly. That will work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Take out the, uh, the, uh, the eye. Just be that match. Yeah. There we go. Log that. This is live code. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we did it. All right. Looks good, right? So, so I've used the array methods before. I just didn't know that you get the benefits that you're talking about in Haskell from using them. Yeah. Um, so unless I actually go and modify this links in the body here, mm -hmm. um, it. Shouldn't modify the list. Uh, it's not that like the B is. What's that? Is, I mean, if you modify the B in there, that's the No, it's just filtering based off of that. So that's returning the new list. Right. We should still have our <coughs> original list intact. Cool. Yeah, so that's how you would do it in JavaScript. Um, Although you should really name your function. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, wow. How would you do it in Scala? <laughs> Scala, all right. Well, Scala does have a neat thing. When we were talking about tail recursion, there's actually an annotation to warn you that you're not doing a tail call. So that's awesome. I was thinking about originally doing it mixed with um, Scala because you have that 
you can kind of enforce it. But yeah. Question. So have you noticed when you're writing functional programming that it feels like procedural? Because once you once you put all of your functions, your little baby functions together, you're just making a list of things that you're doing. True. It to some extent. Weird, um, but. So the state is kind of encapsulated in the set of closures you have with the set of calls. And at some point, you have to make a call or two to spark the whole program, right? right. So you can see here in Haskell, they kind of package it in a way that they call functional. And it, it is. It's like a, this is um, a string I.O. monad thing, which I'm not going to get into. But the, it basically packages it as a functional recipe to do non-functional things. So at the end of the day, somewhere, you're probably going to have to get some input or spit something out. And that is not functional. But if you keep the majority of your code functional, you get all of these benefits. I just heard criticism in the past of a functional programming language. And everyone's like, well, it looks like procedural. So well, yeah, and so will imperative. Imperative will, too, eventually. Yeah. If, you, if you write methods that are basically kind of like this, except they're not written in recursion. They're written in what you would see in imperative. And then you're basically stepping one method after another. You're going to get there, too. I just wondered if you have felt the same way with functional, or if there's a different way of putting the code together to where it doesn't feel like you're kind of starting to write procedural programming as For a series the, yeah. of functions. Yeah. You know For I mean? the most part, it doesn't, in my experience. But it, the hard part is figuring out how to contain those side effects and how to contain these state changes. And um, actually, we were just talking about Scala. So Scala kind of started off as an experiment of like how how can I bring OOP together with functional? And so there's things are immutable by default, but you can make them mutable. You can do a lot of things there. And Scala really kind of solidifies it in your mind, like trying to minimize or contain where you're modifying things and keep all the rest of your code functional so that you can test the majority of it really easily, debug it really easily, and then you have that small piece there. And also, um, and this kind of can be uh, attributed to um, higher order functions and composing functions as well. If you sort of like make generic functions or you contain those state changes in some object or some place, you can, e it usually ends up that that's where the errors are coming from, is somewhere in there. Um, so like if I, before I was kind of touching on it, but like this filter in valid URLs, if we wanted to make one, we had like the single filter method, but say we wrote it on our own for whatever reason. We had our filter method, and we had two different filters filtering on different things that were both having issues. It's pretty clear then, well, most likely what's going on is the error is in your higher order function, your filter function, and not in the functions that are doing the filtering. Function, function, function. Um, but yeah, so those are my thoughts at least. Anything so else? you mentioned something within the history that kind of fell off because of hardware. Mm -hmm. Is it just because now memory is crazy, stupid, cheap right now, and we have hardware coming out of our backsides, so that like functional programming again? Or was there something <clears throat> that changed about functional programming that made it attractive again with more and more programmers? A little bit of all of that. Okay. So we have much, much better hardware. And one of the main things, at least way back in the day, was these patterns kind of require garbage collection, which was really expensive back then. Um, so there was that, and also um, there's optimizations you can make for sure, but you create more objects in memory. Um, any good <laughs> functional language is going to do it in such a way that you can reuse most of that and only create new things for what's changed. But um, there's optimizations there. There's the tail recursion optimizations that uh, compilers can make now. But also, one of the main reasons it's starting to gain in popularity is because now everything's becoming distributed, and or concurrent, or both. And um, when you don't have a mutable state, it's a whole lot easier to reason about concurrent code. 
And so you end up just passing around a lot of data that never changes, rather than having to do stuff like locking and distributed locks and crazy stuff like that. So if your program doesn't require it, it's a whole lot easier for developers to wrap their head around code that's doing that, rather than trying to figure out where you're supposed to lock and where you're not supposed to to avoid your like deadlocks and stuff like that. So there's that. And I'm sure plenty of other reasons that either are coming to mind or um, testing too. And yeah, testing, debugging. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons why it's becoming popular again. So I was just going to say, I had a, a boss once who said that one of the other benefits is when you do something wrong in it, generally it puts you exactly in the line number where something went wrong because, because of the fact that the same input gives you the same output, as opposed to uh, close the side effects where something could come in and modify an object uh, outside of where you're actually looking or where you expect it to be. So, yeah. plugging in that way and, and uh, fixing problems is considerably uh, easier. Yeah, definitely. And that just goes back to what I was saying about like trying to contain where you're doing the state changes when you have to, but having everything else be pure because it's really easy to trace down those bugs and those issues. Um, so yeah, all great things. Anything else? So I wonder if the hospital, I mean, does it actually give you API to access file system and all the underlying systems? Yeah, so you'll, you'll have to probably import some libraries, but... Right, so if you're doing like a lot of I, Let's say you're doing I.O. Um, using languages, and there must be a lot of like error handling exceptions and all stuff. Is that help? Can you handle that and use the pure function? Everything, so I had mentioned I.O. monads. Everything that's I.O. needs to be contained in some monad, right? Okay. And again, just think, it's like a basically a recipe to do something in a functional manner that requires some input from outside sources or output. Um, and there is where you usually try and track your errors. Um, yeah. Matt? Yeah, um, you can ignore me if you want, but so on line 14, on line 21, we need to do a partial application instead of explicitly putting that argument in there? I can. So, um, I don't have no more. we got time. All right. So let's talk a bit quickly about currying functions and partial application like Matt had mentioned. So currying, as I should go back and talk, so Haskell is a guy's first name, his last name is Curry. His, he's, Haskell is named after him and so is Curry. So he's like a functional programming god or something, I don't know. Um, so what currying is, is if you have a function that takes multiple parameters, uh, when you curry it, you take and break off one of those parameters. So you basically, out of that, create a function that takes a single parameter and binds that into the closure and returns a function that takes the rest of the parameters. Right? Or you can, you know, curry out all of the parameters. So let's real quick, I'll start up the console. If we look at the type of filter. So here we have a function that takes some type of value. A is a type, not um, the parameter. Um, some type of value and turns it into a Boolean. But here we have two more arrows. Why? So this is the second, this is our list that we pass in. But that's just two. And uh, then we have this other one here. And two arrows instead of just one. Um, that's because in Haskell, everything is, by default is curry. So what Mac was talking about is, and it's the main benefit of being able to curry these functions, is you can apply them partially. So um, we can rewrite these functions. Well, not this one. I'd have to rearrange some of the stuff there. But for filter and valid URLs, I can actually remove this. URL's parameter. Now this is called point-free notation, something like that, because we don't, we no longer have the explicit parameter. But what we're doing is we're partially applying filter to our function. So what that's going to return is 
a single function that takes a list and filters it based on its valid URL. So let me save that and I need to actually call in our program. And let's see, well, I can just run main again. And it does the exact same thing. Does that make sense? So what I did was I took off the, the parameter being explicitly there and passing it into the call from filter and instead apply the is valid URL function to filter but leave off that second parameter and then when uh, I store it here in this filter invalid URLs, it's still a function that takes a list and does this specific mapping onto the list. Or not mapping, filtering, sorry. And because of the fact that on line 26 you pass in the links, you're, you're resolving the overall need of that function, which is it needs a list and it, the rest of it's just there, right? Kind of. What I'm really doing here, so we talked about closures before. When I call filter just on this one value, it's binding that function to the function parameter that it's expecting. And then now it's just a function that just expects a list. And because uh, it already has this, we've already given it that. And you can do the same in JavaScript with bind, and uh, there's like uh, underscore partial and can do a lot of stuff with it in JavaScript. Do you need that first URL then? What's that? On 14. No. Oh, no, no. I just I started typing it in. Oh, okay. That accomplishes the exact same thing. Here, because it's in line, I'd have to do some trickery, but um, I don't even know if I'd be able to do that. You can on 21. Yeah. Is there any real benefit to doing that? Less to me. Yeah, more extensible is the other. You can do a lot more when you write it like that. Potentially. So there's no void at all? No. No. So there's functions can not take parameters, but then they need to return a constant value. Um, monads do crazy trickery stuff, but at the end of the day, they're supposed to return values too. So no, there's not really any sort of void function. Everything needs to have evaluate to some value. And that goes right back to our talk about referential transparency and pure functions. They all need to evaluate to something. Good? Anything else? All right, cool. So, um, thank you guys for uh, staying through. Also, I'll post the slides, but I have some external resources if you're more interested in doing some deeper reading.